Hey, welcome back to Nick Beardia. This is Garbro bringing you the second installment and hopefully last installment of the Izakai Dragon with your boy, Yogg. I uh, hope you guys enjoy. Let's get into the story. Time's a wasting. In the day spent catching up with the pirates, our group begins to integrate with the crew. I spend most of my time helping out in the kitchens. Don't judge. Cooking's so darn relaxing, you know. It turns out that for various reasons, despite frame and shell of the vessel being crafted from adamantine, open flames were forbidden aboard the Tempest. Apparently someone fucked up on one of its sister ships when lighting up certain illicit substances for their consumption. Somehow this led to a small area in the vessel catching fire. No real damage since the bones and frame of the vessel was all adamantine, but it still got open flames banned. What's worse is that magical hot plates are a relatively new piece of tech, one that the budgetary committee wasn't willing to shell out for. Poor Cookie does what he can with what he has, but he has to feed the crew things that don't need to be cooked. This is completely unacceptable. Luckily, some of the tricks Dad taught me allow you to conjure kitchen necessities, hot plates included. I spend a few days teaching Cookie how to use that trick. Apparently that particular magic is a bit obscure, but the half orc picks it up quickly enough. In return, he teaches me a few magical recipes considered traditional among the Rosagrav Navy. A fish fillet that'll help you swim, a burger that will keep you from getting pinned down, and a style of fried potato that helps clear the mind. Vivian latches onto this poor necromancer woman and starts tormenting her. The necromancer isn't quite right in the head to begin with, and Vivian, hanging around in her fox form, decides to pretend that she can't talk except when the two of them are alone. Apparently, Vivian tried to convince her to murder the rest of the crew. It gets to the point where the poor woman runs off and locks herself away with the Admiral in the deepest part of the ship. There's always that one player, isn't there? Always that one weird as fuck player. The Admiral, it turns out, is an intelligent undead skull that controls the ship, made from the body of a retired naval officer who volunteered for this duty on his deathbed. Pretty fucking based. Technically speaking, we're all inside of his body. Vivian tries to follow the neck. I hope the DM doesn't have some weird vor fetish. Cause that's a vor fetish within a vor fetish within like actual storytelling. And that there's a, that, that, that's a slippery slope right there. <laughs> Vivian tries to follow the necromancer in, but the door gets slammed shut in Vivian's face before she can slip through the crack. Our party sociopath goes to try and torment the other necromancer, but Grigori's a harder nut to crack. Also a crazier nut to crack. He and I have a good conversation on the nature of the universe over breakfast. He's a follower of someone who's like my boy, as it turns out, but he's doing the following wrong because that lore has been lost to time. I'll need to fix that. Later though. It turns out that the ship's quartermaster hit off with Hugh and Korger. Kor Korger. 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 And she asked the two of them to go check out on the necromancer that Vivian had been tormenting. No one knew where she went, except for Vivian, who was off pilfering one thing or another. Korger and Hugh eventually managed to track her whereabouts down. They even have a nice heart to heart about life, the universe, and Vivian's latent sociopathy. Figure that after locking herself away for a few days, she could use something to eat. Thus, halfway through my conversation with Grigori, Hugh pops up into existence halfway embedded into the table. Louise, we need a wholesome brunch in the Admiral's quarters, stat. I love cooking far too much to even think of saying no. After bringing down enough brunch for five, we get word from Mare that we'll be on the pirate soon. The weather magic will be going online, calling forth a small storm to provide cover as for the Temptest who breached the surface. We'll be hitting the pirates under the cover of night. Before I talk about what happens with the pirates, I should probably mention a few things mom taught me about dragons, and a few things dad told me about Hugh. There's some stuff that happens on the ship, and that context is needed. Dragons were the five heavenly kings first attempt to build a better human. Apparently, they were dissatisfied by the behavior of humans when they merged into the world. Humans were curious, flighty, and possessing of a far too independent spirit for the kings lacking, for they did not show appropriate respect to their gods. The kings took those humans who showed proper respect and implanted within them a spark of the divine. 
And so were the first dragons born, as a step between the human and the angelic. The dragons became the king's vanguard in their efforts to restore faith and humility to humanity by force. Those dragons were very different from the dragons like my mother and I. One might call them true dragons, while we are false. During the war the kings waged with the dragons as their vanguard, the Lady of Many Faces approached those flights of dragons who were having second thoughts about their service to the kings. As the kings made true dragons from humans, so did the Lady make us from the true dragons. The spark of divinity diminished, and so too the curse of obedience to the king suborned into a curse of hatred for the angelic. A love for some aspect of humanity implanted within them to give dragons skin in the game. For red dragons, such as Mother and I, that aspect is art. That explains why Mom keeps adding galleries to our home to hold paintings and statues. Apparently the art I'm obsessed with is cooking. Of course, all this lore is contradicted by the lore of the Church of the Five Kings. According to them, the kings made all humanoid races in their own image when they first emerged into the world as bringers of life and light. Regarding Hugh, the bloodstone he was forged of was not something dab mined or found in ingots. Apparently it came from some horrific beast that Mom, Dad, and Uncle Reggie helped to slay before the three of them settled down from a life of adventuring. Its bones were the same blood red metal that could be often found adjacent to adamantine veins. Apparently it was a demon some cult conjured through the use of human sacrifice. Imperfectly, because Dad put an arrow in the celebrant before he could complete the rite of sacrifice. They managed to save at least one of the children. The cultists called what they summoned an angel. They named it the Purifier, as if in mockery of the angel Naraya a humble servant of the kings who brings with her plague and famine that humanity might grow stronger for having survived it. Honestly, based upon its description of the thing, it sounds like a plague-bearing angel to me. Old Testament style, or maybe Revelation style, pale horsemen and all that. Uncle Reggie got the felling blow with a reliquary weapon borrowed from the Church of the Lady for the purpose of dealing with anything the cult tried to summon. Father had Hugh forged from one of his bones by a certain traveling blacksmith. He was intelligent from the moment he was completed. Be funny if it was made from a rib bone, wouldn't it? <laughs> Anyways, back to the raid on the pirates. The Tempest surfaces temporarily, just long enough to dispatch a few boats filled with marines backed up by stag heads towards the pirate ship. I take point on one of the boats. The door raised to give us cover from enemy bolts and bullets. It might be wooden appearance, but that shield is tougher than mithril. Korrigir takes the same approach on another boat. His own tower shield made from the good dwarven steel. Below the water, several apparatuses swim out of sight to assault the lower decks while we attack from the surface. It looks like everything is coming together. Once we get close in, I use my force hook and the main mast to batman my way onto the deck. This was a mistake. It turns out that a six foot tall silver haired lady knight clad in black and mithril full plate makes for a rather conspicuous target, even in the dark. The only reason I am not shot out of the air immediately is because it's barely dawn by the time our boats reach the pirates and my dad is a very good blacksmith. Most of the shots miss, the ones that don't splatter against my armor. Even if they don't penetrate, getting struck by a bullet's like taking a heavy punch to the chest. While I'm getting shot at, Hugh teleports up to the guy with the biggest gun that hit me and possesses him with a stab to give us a friendly sniper on their crow's nest. Down below, Pen uses his mind magic to cause the pirates man their volley guns to fall asleep. While Pen ends them rightly, Korgir commandeers one of the volley guns and clears a solid chunk of the deck with it. Buck and Ball is a beautiful thing to see in action. Too bad he can't reload it in a reasonable amount of time. While the pirates and the marines clash across the deck, I try to find someone who looks like a commander so I can ensure they're taken alive for questioning. Notice something unsettling for a moment, but it might just be a trick of the light at dawn. When I blink, it's gone, but I swear I saw thin strings catching upon the light, rising from the bodies of some of the pirates as if they were marionettes. Don't give it too much thought, there's fighting to be done. Leap down to one of the officer looking fellows and give him what for, nearly drop the man in one hit. Before I can finish dropping him, though, one of the enemy majors hits me with a hostile transposition that I can't shrug off. Suddenly I find myself near a hundred feet in the air, plunging towards the water. 
Bastard must have swapped me out for a seagull. Joke's on him though. I'm a dragon. Take my true form for the first time in what feels like years. Wings are not fully developed yet, but even if I can't fly, I can glide the rest of the way down. Dive for the surface of the ship as fast as I can. Hugh decides to join me when I pass him by on the way down. Eh, this guy's gun was out of bullets anyways, and fucked if I know how to reload it. Fixed it himself as a bayonet to the crow's nest sniper's rifle. He puppeteers the man to do a leaping dive attack on the mage who swapped me out for a seagull. It was actually really fucking badass to see in action. Hugh gets impaled right through the major skull at the end of the fall. Poor sniper guy winds up breaking both of his legs and passing out though, leaving Hugh without a body to puppet around. Shift back into my normal form before I land. Hopefully anyone who noticed just thinks I've got a bit of shape shifting up my sleeve. Transformation magic is more common than one would think in this world. At this point, with Coral Greer, Penn, and Vivian's help, the marines and the stag heads have begun to push the pirates to the far side of the deck. Even managed to finally drop that officer looking fellow. Though when I do, I find that I've become the prime target for enemy spell slingers and gunslingers. Luckily, Corriger and Pin managed to pull my ass out of that fire. Vivian even helps, hit me with a strain of her plague that heals some of my wounds. I'm not going to question it. Can't have our meat shield dying before the fighting's done with. And the fighting definitely isn't over with, as we can hear the horrid sound of the crab apparatuses breaking below decks. Two doors are thrown open simultaneously from below decks. A pair of Astrati paladins in full harness emerge from the shadows below. Sweet, a new ride. Hugh does his teleportation trick and tries to possess one of them by impaling his side. The paladin just tanks the wound and rips him out. Oh no. Due to our group's positioning, I'm basically alone in facing down the paladin on my side of the ship. That's not 100% accurate, as my side has a few more marines and stagheads, but in terms of people I know how to fight alongside, I'm basically on my own. Would even take Vivian, but she slunk away when the paladins began glowing to help the crab apparatuses clear the below decks. That keeps reinforcements off of me and the marines, so I won't complain. Down a potion of infernal healing because even with Vivian's healing plague, I'm not nearly at full strength. Get locked in a duel with the paladin on my side of the ship. I'm just enough of a threat for him to focus on me rather than cut down the more lightly armored marines. I've also just enough protection to not be cut down where I stood. Whenever I catch a blow with my shield, I can feel the deck begin to crack beneath my feet. On the other side, Corgreer come on, come, come on. C commandeers, commandeers, fuck. Corgreer commandeers another unfired volley gun and empties all eight barrels of it into the paladin. The pirates behind the paladin are transformed into a fine and bloody mist from the bucking ball bouncing off across the walls. The paladin is still standing, but he lost the arm that was wielding Hugh. Pin's mind magics hit a wall against the paladins, some force rebuffing his psychic screams of go to sleep, go to sleep, go to sleep doesn't stop him from using more blunt and damaging my magics to force the issue though. Hugh assumes direct control of one of the stag heads and flanks the paladin while Corrigar keeps him back with his giant sticker. Back with me, I hear the paladin I'm fighting say a few words that I really didn't want to hear. By the judgment of the king in gold I declare, smite evil! I don't have time to process how it feels to have a hostile brand applied to my soul. His blade guided by the kings, he pierces my defenses and runs me through. Without a second thought, he kicks my lifeless corpse from his blade. Hey guys, do you like models in your tabletop role-playing games? Cause we do too. Do you like having big bitty waifus on your table? Cause we do too. <laughs> <laughs> we got human bitties, we got lizard bitties, we got orc bitties, oni bitties, Cat bussies. We've got everything you want at neckbeardia.co.uk. <laughs> Check the links down below. It helps us out a lot. Sorry for interrupting the video. Let's get on the story. Once again, I find myself in that expansive plane of shadows. Hey, hey, Louise. Yogg here. Just wanted to wish you congratulations on dying there. So are you here to fling my soul to some other place in time? Oh, do you not remember? Interesting. Remember what? I'm just gonna let this one be a surprise. Also, fun fact, when you die, you're no longer subject to effects like Smite Evil. Louise's Daily Automatic Revivals. 
Zero. Never of times Louise has died. One. This time it's my entire body that feels like it's been set on fire and not just my mind. Okay, that's brisk. Well, the good news is that I'm no longer dead on the ground. The bad news is the Astrati Paladin has turned to cut down one of the Tempest's marines. His back's turned to me, and while I might be flat on my ass, I have the initiative. I kip up and charge him shield first, throwing all my weight behind it to batter him about. Staggering a step back, he turns his attention back to me. He's got the same look of annoyance on his face that I get when I think I swat a fly, but it crawls out from under the paper and buzzes off again. The kings no longer guide his blows. I manage to catch a furious flurry with my shield. A lucky hit from the silver key caves in part of his breastplate, and I pull the trigger. In an instant, half of his face is blown away, flesh and blood scoured clean from a skull with a look of polished mithril. It's too much to ask for that to have dropped him. And in case you guys are curious, more or less, I'm pretty sure his axe blade hit his breastplate, barrels aimed at the face, we went whack and pulled the trigger, and more or less blew his face off. So it all makes sense. It does. He doesn't even let out a noise of pain. Another flurry of sword blows colliding with my shield. Only one manages to get through my guard, but I'm not dead yet. Before either of us can land a finishing blow, the head of a spear bursts through his chest. Mayor landed the killing blow, and I'm far too exhausted to care that we couldn't take him alive. Bastard had the goal to die with a smile on his face though. That pisses me off a bit. I love this exchange right here. The content. It's all well and good that you had fun, but that doesn't make the story less cringe to the uninvolved reader. <laughs> Any specifics? Where to start? Isekai. Dragon, but appears to be human. Super special weapon for free. Automatic revival. That's about the part where I found myself unable to continue reading. <laughs> this man's fucking Mary Sue detector's going rink, rink, rink. The rest of the party managed to kill their paladin without anyone dying. Emptying eight barrels of buck and ball did most of the work for them. Hugh jumping from stag head to broken stag head kept the paladin from hurting anyone who was alive. Corrigrear got the finishing blow with his giant sticker. Apparently that one seemed to be pleased with dying as well. After the marines mop up, we go to secure the ship. Corrigrear heads below decks to find a bunch of pirates dead from Vivian's super plague. Also a good number of slaves that the pirates had taken chained up below decks. Corrigrear does what any sane man would do and sunders their chains, getting them in order and getting food and drink to the ones that need it. Meanwhile, Hugh and I join the captain in examining the wards on the door to the captain's chamber. Hugh identifies the language that they're written in as angelic. None of us are really equipped to disarm them in the traditional way, and Hugh seems to be rightly spooked by the appearance of that stuff. Apparently, he came across that stuff when he, Dad, and Uncle Reggie were on adventures. It always came up when some spooky shit was going down. Just in case, I paint them over with an elder sign, the tree, not the star, to try and block out any outside influence. Great, great success! <laughs> By Stavocles, you've done it. Hugh rarely invokes the name of his god, so he must be pleased. Somehow, painting the door with the elder sign managed to collapse the wards of the captain's cabin. How delightfully convenient. <laughs> this sets my concern levels to maximum as Hugh, Captain Hawthorne, and I push the doors open. In the room, a cultist in brown robes stands in the center of a magic circle, slowly bloodletting himself to complete it. Two additional cultists moan in suffering outside their circle, their own bodies drained of blood. The angelic script and geometric patterns have almost been completed by the time we get the door open. The cultist looks up, irritated at our interruption of his work. He puts the knife to his own neck. Better incomplete than never. <laughs> he tries to slit his own throat, but Hugh swapped places with his knife. The cultist's body freezes up as if turned to stone. Uh, Captain? Louise, there's someone on the other end, and it's big. Oh no. A noose lowers down from the ceiling. No, through the ceiling. We tried to drag the cultist away from it, but he's as heavy as a leaden statue and the noose follows him regardless of where we move him. Try to cut the noose with the silver key, but it cannot touch incorporeal objects. Neither can Captain Hawthorne's cutlass. We can only watch as it settles around the cultist's neck and tightens before yanking his body upward, snapping his neck. We would not learn this for some time, but the same thing happened to every survivor of the enemy forces. 
It would have happened to the slaves as well, but breaking their chains freed them from the ritual. The liquor out in a circle. The liquor out? The liquor. What? The liquor. <laughs> the liquor out and the circle glows. Captain Hawthorne freezes like a statue, and something looms over us in steel gray robes. Who are you to have summoned me? I want to kill it. My heartbeat pounds in my ears the moment I lay eyes on that thing. I want to rip it apart. My vision turns red, my mind goes blank as some primitive primal hatred washes over me. I want to hack off his limbs. My blood sings for violence, surges with categorical imperative to wreck its body, leave it broken and mangled, crush its skull beneath my sabatons. I want to dance atop its broken corpse. I see that the lady still trains her bloodhounds well. Or is it that training so well ingrained by now that it runs within their blood? The fact that it speaks in mockery of the human tongue, my precious humans, how dare you, offends me down to my core, but at least I can think again, hear something besides the rush of blood pounding in my ears. I almost miss the fact that Hugh is no longer shaped like Hugh, but instead a features humanoid Eh. But instead, a features humanoid being of white that glows softly like a candle. Like him, but to him what mother and I are the true dragons. That makes sense, he was made from bones of one by the hands of a human smith. Wretched angel, I want to kill it. But I know in this state that I can't. So I listen to it with glaring eyes that betray my heart's desire. But it doesn't care, doesn't see me as a threat. That offends me more than its voice. It speaks of what Hugh is, what he might become if given time to grow, confirming to me that he is to an angel what I am to a true dragon. It speaks of its offense of how it had been summoned, and its desire to bring that which crafted this bloody play to justice. I scoff. What care does an angel have for human lives? But as I am, I am powerless to stop it from leaving to investigate. In a mockery of a peace offering and as a sign of its good intentions, it entrusts to us one of its blades, an executioner's sword. I simply glare at it until it leaves. When the angel leaves, time resumes. Now unfrozen, Captain Hawthorne asks why I have such a scary expression on my face. Apparently I was still glaring holes into the wall where I've been standing. With that damnable angel gone, my heart is still and I'm able to wrangle my anger back into control. I still want to kill it though. We inform Captain Hawthorne of what just happened and he looks troubled. While we're on the island, he means to write up a report of what happened aboard the ship and send it back to the capital for Lady Avis's approval. He gets a very strange look on his face when I call her Auntie. Auntie. Auntie? Auntie? What do you want to call her? We spend a good while aboard the ship getting the prisoners treated for diseases and injuries they took during their captivity. Korgrir turns out to be just as good with a needle and thread as he is with a hammer and anvil, and crafts them all some decent clothes in a jiffy. Wind up helping Mare catch some fish for a victory celebration aboard the captured ship. Just one problem. A few dozen feet below the ship, an aquatic dragon is floating around, trying to keep out of sight among the kelp. I drink a potion of air bubble and take to my dragon form to see if we can communicate. Fortunately, it's not there to eat me or anyone else, for that matter. It's actually been following the Tempest for a while now. Apparently her boyfriend is among the crew? Okay, it's not her boyfriend, he's just a friend. Okay, maybe not a friend, but uh, an acquaintance. It's complicated. They're nutty buddies. Gotcha. <laughs> Point is, she gave him a love potion when they met while he was on shore leave. The type of love potion that seals the deal for a romance between a dragon and a human. Mom gave Dad one of those, it's why he's a dragon now. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? So, it's a love potion that turns a human into a dragon. What are you trying to say here? Oh shit, suffice it to say, her clan patriarch wants the potion retrieved before he drinks it. Apparently the guy didn't even know that she's a dragon. Quest accepted. I am physically retching, take this to slash A. <laughs> Cook up a small feast for the prisoners and the marines in celebration of our victory. Lots of fish, plenty of fish, way too much goddamn fish. 
While I do have rice, the rice I do have is closer to Spanish rice than Japanese rice, and hasn't been husked to begin with. That's fine. Polished rice has next to zero nutrition, I actually kind of hate Japanese food. Except for wasabi, but most wasabi is just horseradish paste anyways, so... We wind up laying out a spread of grilled fish fillets that might have been gently seasoned with salt, pepper, and rosemary, letting the fresh ingredients speak for themselves. As side dishes, we set out platters of horseradish infused smashed potatoes, broiled asparagus topped with parmesan, collard greens, Waldorf salad, cold cuts, and a balsamic salad made of chickpeas, red peppers, edamame, kidney beans, red onions, and carrots. For those prisoners with too delicate of a stomach to eat anything substantial due to their treatment, we prep soup, oatmeal, and other simple things that are easy to digest. While people are eating, a card game gets started where the sailors and marines put up their shares of the loot, or items that are nice but don't have much in the way of practical or sentimental value to them. Don't take part in all that, that much. Too busy helping with dessert and cleanup after the little feast Cookie and I put together. Corgir's too busy helping with the prisoners to do much. Hugh's too busy chatting up the necromancer that Vivian had been tormenting. Apparently, I wasn't the only person who got killed during that fight without dying, though she has her fairy godmother to thank rather than the patronage of some dubious outer god. Fairy godmother. Is this like deus machina of the campaign? Winds up that only Vivian ends up participating in the card game. Vivian ends up sweeping everything. Don't remember everything that she won, but at the very least she won a very fine bottle of wine. Go to Mayor and ask if any of the other crew have any paramours in a foreign port. Oh shit, what did Alfred... what did Alfredo... <laughs> ah shit, what did Alfredo do now? Alfredo be at port call, spreading that creamy white cheese sauce everywhere he can. That dragon, full on pasta nest, swimming in sauce. Apparently, the officer in question has a history of wooing women and leaving them hung out to dry. Calmly explained the situation to her, leaving out the bits about dragons. Oh, don't worry, most love potions don't even work. Explain that this was has. Was has. The guy who wrote this peed me, by the way, and I want you to know, you're listening. I know you are. I'm judging you. Was has. Come on, even the chicken's angry. How dare you. Has a little bit extra something to it. What, like alcohol? Explain that no, it has something a bit magically extra. What else would they? Oh, shit, was that you talking to the Aquan down there, wasn't it? I hang my head, guilty as charged. Mary and I run off to have a chat with the Tim Pestone enemy of women. Drag him off from a poker game to somewhere with a bit more privacy. He very much gets the wrong impression of what we want from him. Nip that in the bud before he starts fantasizing. Where's the love potion, Alfredo? <laughs> Alfredo. <laughs> Listen here, Linguini. Alright. Like Mayor, he thinks it was just a harmless souvenir from a paramour. Unlike Mayor, he doesn't know that dragons aren't as extinct as certain factions claim them to be. I show him my true form. He laughs. Apparently, draconic forms are popular with shapeshifters these days. The girl who gave him the potion could do it, and she was just a shifter. Share a look with Mare. We both palm our faces in exasperation. Look, if the potion is really that important, go find the fox girl. I lost it to her in a game of cards. Fiddlefucks. Consider that quest failed because Vivian hoards treasure like a squirrel hoards acorns. Mare thinks that she can be convinced to part with it for the right price. Maybe one of her kidneys. Search all over the Tempest for Vivian, but she doesn't show up anywhere. Even her favorite chewed toy necromancer hasn't been bothered by her since before the pirate hunting. Wonder for a moment if we left her with the prize crew in the pirate ship. Would that be so bad? Eventually run into her having gotten into Cookie's larder, stuffing her fat fox face on smoked meats and cheese. The potion bottles next to her, freshly drained. Some of her fur has turned into scales, because of course it did. And of course, she just burps a cloud of scolding steam at us that nearly melts off Mare's face. She's gone before either of us can say a word to her. Would chase after her, but getting Mare to the medic before any permanent damage set in is more important. As we do, Captain joins us for the walk and reminds me that we need to pick up an away team for the mission to the Island of Storms. Mare immediately volunteers to stay behind and not go within 15 miles of that cursed place. Sorry, Korger actually requested you specifically. 
Well, she's fine as long as none of the creepier necromancers join. I tell the captain that I like the fellow who keeps to the other guys to join us, crushing Mare's hopes and dreams into despair. The final away team consists of Mare, my lad, Vivian's chew toy, a cleric that Penn had befriended but no one was looking, and some dude he'd been hanging out with who had the unfortunate name of Guido G. Jabroni. Guido G. Jabroni. Alfredo. Uh. I don't know who your DM is, but uh, he's got a. There, there are apps for this for pick, for picking names. Guido G Jabroni. That's a fucking red shirt name. <laughs> Only good things will come of this. Oh, and that's the end. Hmm. Well. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the end of Ezekai Dragon. Um, unfortunately, your boy Yog. Hey, hey, people. Yog here didn't show up much. The story. That's a shame. But, uh, we'll see if he wrote any more, and maybe James will find it. I don't know. Anyway, thanks for stop for stopping by and finishing up part two of Isekai Dragon. If you like these stories and other stories like them, be sure to like and subscribe to Neckbeardia. And if you like original stories written through the week, month, day, however the hell it is, it's a painful, painful schedule right now, uh, stop by Garbeardia, where I live, and I create my own original stories, I got my first book out for publication, self-publishing, nothing too fancy, keep your fucking shorts on. And uh, I have two other books being written right now. Um, also, check out the Neckbeardia modeling page, gonna have titty frogs here out here soon. We'll be mailing them to James here probably this week, I'd reckon. But yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> it's been interesting. But until I see you next time on this side of the veil, this has been Guard Bro. And this is Neckbeardia.